Welcome to another episode of the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast with your host, Andrew Langer. Well, hey there. Welcome to another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. I'm your host, Andrew Langer. And whether or not you're listening to us or watching us, you know, uh, if you are watching us, you can also hear the audio wherever fine podcasts are found. Uh, whether or not it's uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Amazon Music. And if you're listening to us, if you want to watch us, you can find us on YouTube. And tell your friends, tell your family, tell your friends' family uh, about the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. I have to do these nowadays. I want to bring our guest on. Very excited to have him on today. His name is Chris Bedford. He is the executive editor of the Common Sense Society. We're going to get into what that's all about uh, formerly, he was a senior editor at The Federalist. He worked uh, was an editor at the Daily Caller News Foundation. You are also, by the way, a fellow, uh, a Lincoln Fellow with the Claremont Institute, a Pulliam Fellow at Hillsdale, and a Madison Fellow. Lots of lots of fellows there. Lots of presidents. Yes, yes. <laughs> in, in, in point of fact, but let's start here because I hadn't realized, I ran into you at a, watch, saw you at a, at a meeting and sort of looked up to see where you are, this You've gone over to this organization called the Common Sense Society. This is interesting to me for a lot of reasons. I didn't realize Common Sense Society has been around since 2009. In 2013 or so, as the first iteration of the uh, Tea Party movement was sort of winding down, I was sort of seeing that there should be some kind of a common sense movement out there, not realizing that the Common Sense Society was already in existence Talk about the organization. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me. Always. Uh, Common Sense Society was founded over in Budapest by Marion Smith, who's an American who was studying over there, and his now wife, Anna, uh, who now lived here together in Virginia. Um, it was started as kind of a – just to bring debate uh, yep. initially to about about things that matter to B the Budapest University they were at and then to uh, expand it to South Carolina when they moved back to the United States and bring that – People talking about big ideas, people actually coming together um, to talk about foreign policy, to talk about what the founders might have believed, right. to talk about philosophy, history. Um, and it was kind of a side project for a number of years. Uh, and then about two years ago, uh, Marion uh, joined it full time. He'd been at the Victims of Communist Memorial Foundation. Sure, of course. Before that, at Heritage Foundation. And since then, it's uh, rapidly expanded. Uh, there, they, there are fellowships right now in South Carolina, a, a fellowship in Scotland uh, and London, uh, fellowships in uh, Hungary, where they bring yeah. young, rising intellectuals together and kind of talk to them about the ideas of liberty and prosperity and beauty, uh, as well as educating teachers, holding seminars, doing conferences, um, and kind of bringing folks together. Uh, I joined the Common Sense Society uh, just late last year yeah. with the intent of starting a magazine. Okay. A, a general interest magazine, a glossy magazine. Called Hopefully Common Sense. Exactly. Called course. Common Sense Magazine. And it's going to have a little bit of something for everyone. It's going to have some cooking and some history really? and some drinks and some architecture and some art and there's some music. But at its core, we'll have some very, uh, what we hope to be, it's my job to make it so, yeah. very thoughtful pieces on where we are as a culture, where we are as a society, um, uh, articles from people from both the left and the right, but to particularly challenging some of the elite opinions. Uh, some of our models for magazines are things like uh, Garden and Gun, sure. for that kind of a feel, but but to ha add an intellectual heft to it. Sure. So it will be uh, an interesting magazine for, for casual reading or for really digging you know, in. It's interesting to me because there is certainly, I mean, we talk about the marketplace of ideals. I was just talking with somebody about the mar marketplace of ideas. And there, there is this niche there. I mean, I want to get into common sense philosophy, but just talking about the magazine itself, I mean, that's really exciting. Listen, I would volunteer. I would volunteer myself to write about cooking. But you're an avid cook. I want to get into this with you. <laughs> I know, I know you are. So I know you're probably going to wind up doing a lot of that yourself. But we need something like this. We need something fun that people can read and they can get there culture, architecture, because I know, as you said, there's that's part of one of these issues uh, that Common Sense Society deals with, the issue of, of beauty. But we also need to have these discussions of of intellectual heft. That's a, that's a great, a great you know, I'm, I'm calling it a niche, I think, undersells it. I think that there is a vast market for that. I right think now. there is, too. Uh, our, the late Roger Scruton yeah. was uh, on our board and was active in the Common Sense Society. And his uh, concepts and ideas about culture and beauty and music do inform a lot of what we're doing. Because uh, by and large, uh, common sense ideas have really seeded right. the culture. 
uh, music is certainly gone downhill, and when it hasn't, there's some actually some really great acts out there, but a lot of it's spreading some kind of wild ideas, or if any ideas at all. Right. Any ideas at all, right. Architecture uh, and art, people have been confused and kind of lied to. I really loved the moment uh, where they had the Martin Luther King Memorial that was unveiled in Boston sure. this past year. Because, I mean, for the last like 50 years, modern art has basically been a practical joke that the sure. experts play on the regular people. And everyone, they're always laughing at us as sure. we look at that and they say, trust me, you don't understand how beautiful this is. Oh, yeah. And you sit there scratching your head and say, I think I see it. But the MLK uh, Embrace Memorial that yes. came out, two uh, disembodied arms hugging each other, was so over the top yeah. that everyone just immediately laughed at it. Yes. The Boston Globe wrote an article where the only person they could find saying anything positive about it was the mayor at the dedication speech. <laughs> uh, so we want to talk about some of the issues like that. But pe- Why, when you walk around Washington, D.C., do you walk between gorgeous buildings like sure. the Capitol and the Jefferson Library that were right near, and then you walk past some of the ugliest buildings you've ever seen, like... The uh, housing and urban development building, uh, just absolutely heinous. And say, okay, what's the difference between this? Where have we lost it? And why can't we talk about that? You know, I I talk about, and I'm not going to mention specifically my alma mater. People can go and look it up online if they want to. But they built a a monument to enslaved people that has all of the appeal, literally, of a a, a highway uh, rest stop bathroom. I mean, it it, it, it is it, it is in no it is in no way appealing. And if I, anyway, I, I just I think you're absolutely correct. You walk around DC and you see the the what I call sort of the brutalism, uh, brutalist yeah. architecture, which you know uh, may not have it has no soul. I guess this is what we're talking about. Is we're talking about yes, architecture with no soul, music with no soul. As we move into an era, I was just talking to somebody about Chat GPT and AI. You know, the idea that 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 a soulless artificial intelligence can somehow develop music that that is astounding to me this is what common sense is pushing back against isn't exactly it? it's yeah. pushing back against those sorts of things the soullessness of it the the lack of humanity the the and and brutalism actually served a purpose for its its, its founders its inventors they, they wanted an architecture that made people feel small they wanted to call mm. out the ugliness of the world they wanted an architecture that was simply efficient Yes, uh, and strong, and that would let people would not give people these lofty ideas about Western civilization and where they came from. They were trying to let people know you're just a cog in the machine. Mm. Therefore, you're a worker. Therefore, you must rise up. This yes. is a, it's Soviet architecture. It's very different from the way DC was to, crafted. To ru- wait, you you need to rise up, or you need to. And get your place as part of the proletariat. Depends on where they're building it. Sure, yes, of course. If they're building it in Washington, D.C., that sort of thing is to let you know that that there's – to to disconnect you from the civilization around you. But uh, if you're in Soviet Russia, then this is your place. This is part of it. It's interesting because I remember um, it it was very controversial at the time when the EPA headquarters in southwest D.C., Southeast DC closed, which was just a horrible, horrendous building. It's filled with yeah. rats. Yes, it was just terrible. I love those stories. And then they moved to the uh, what used to be the Interstate Commerce Commission building, which is right off of what Eleventh or Twelfth Street. It's one of those gorgeous buildings along Pennsylvania Avenue, and and there was sort of a a disconnect there at work. But you know, it seemed to fit the early EPA that they would be in this brutalist yes. building way way back when. But but you 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 said a you said a phrase, and and I think this is also what gets down to it, which is the issue of Western civilization, um, which is frankly under attack. And I, I get the sense that the Common Sense Society is really doing what it can to defend those principles of Western civilization, and for a very good reason. I mean, am I right here? Talk about this. Yeah, it's not just under attack; it's crumbling. It's, yes, it's. Uh, when, for example, let's take a let's take the statue debate that we're having right now in Richmond. I know that there are nuanced ideas about sure. whether or not other statues should have come down. Um, I kind of lean towards yes. Uh, some of my colleagues mm-hmm. at Common Sense lean strongly toward no. But what really comes down to it is it's we have we live in a culture right now that's capable of tearing things down. Any yes. kind of culture right. can. A barbarian uh, barbarian tribe can tear things down. We don't live in a culture that's willing to build things up. Right. So if you go to Richmond now, Monument Row, which does not need to have giant statues or Confederate sure. generals on it, has nothing. Right. It's got it's got police uh, fencing sure. around around empty pedestals. The pedestals were even gone. It's completely closed off. It's it's ugly and yes. it's sad and it's dreary. Uh, the monuments, uh, uh, monuments take you have to you have to have a society that believes in itself, that sure. understands truth, that understands beauty, that understands that there is intrinsic value in these things, in order to have a society that's willing to 
build them. And we do have the skills. I remember right. after uh, Notre Dame, which I was just at, first caught on fire, yeah. there were questions, well, do we even have the skills to right. rebuild sure. this? Absolutely. We absolutely do. They're, one, there are incredible architects out there, incredible artists, which we hope to highlight, who are doing great work. But the second thing is, the best teacher you've got is the buildings themselves, the right. monuments themselves. Uh, a good craftsman or artisan can walk into Notre Dame and look at the beams and look at how it's carved, and they can figure out how to do it. And sure. that's exactly, thank goodness, what they are doing. They yeah. haven't gone with any of the plans. Uh, we can build beautiful statues. We can make great buildings. This is not lost knowledge. We don't live sure. in the, the after the collapse of Rome uh, right. yet, at least. Uh, but we need to have people who are willing to do it. And just like we saw during COVID, just like we uh, really – really express itself. We've been under the rule of experts for so long mm. who go against what the actual average person likes, what sure. they think is beautiful, what they think is good, what they think sounds good. And these these experts always tell us, well, we have to build courthouses like this. It has to be a cement block. It has yeah. to be disgusting. And, and you know what? We'll surround it with a homeless encampment because we're the experts. <laughs> uh, and there are, there's a movement that's coming around. You start to see it, building some actually beautiful uh, courthouses. I think one's in Santa Fe. I can't recall off the top sure. of my head. Uh, People are pushing back, and I th- and I want to kind of light that spark and give people a place where they're like, hey, this is normal. Yes. It's normal to not like this bad art and bad architecture, and it's normal to like nice things, and it's normal to want a prosperous society, and it's normal to not want to be ruled by experts, uh, and it's normal to – it should be normal to be able to enjoy a magazine without being – you know, force-fed all right. the kind of insanity that you get from so much of our popular culture. Yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, it's funny, actually. There's so many ways to go with this. I, I, let me start here, then I want to come back to the magazine issue. So I worked, when I was on the radio, I worked with a gentleman, um, African-American radio host, former state senator in Maryland, who came from a storied Maryland African-American Democratic political family. And he had a very simple test for monuments. If a monument was built after the Civil War as a way of trying to bring people together— right? And as a way of, of honoring people and bringing people together, that's a monument that should stay. But if it was a monument that was built to intimidate people or to mm-hmm. foment uh, dissent and, and, and division, that's a monument that should be taken down. But again, it's a common sense position, but it's one that seems to be abandoned. And it's one that we're actually ha- in a debate about right now, because the Pentagon has taken the authority given into it by Congress up in 2020. Oh my goodness, we're talking about forts. Uh, yes. yes. So okay, forts please. is one yeah. thing, but They've, they've, they, they feel like they've taken this authority to rename forts and street yeah. names and to tear down the Confederate memorial that was put in Arlington Cemetery. Now, this right. memorial has an interesting history. Uh, after the Spanish-American War, there was the first time that this country had really come back together. Some of the older veterans of that war had fought against opposite sides of right. the Civil War. We all fought under the same banner. There was a rekindled feeling of friendship and bond between the American yeah. people, which is, if you look at any country in world history that had a nearly as brutal a civil war as the United States sure. had, uh, there was no rekindling of affection right. that quickly, at least. But 30 years later, with still people who'd survived the first war and fought in it, fighting in the second, they come back together. Hold on, time out for a second, Chris. Let's put this in perspective. So you're, you're 30 years after the end of the civil war, so we're talking 1895, eight, eight, in the late, late 1890s. We're talking about in our history something that would have happened in the 1990s, right? Yeah. You, you sort of so you go back, you go back there, and the 1990s is the blink of an eye for all of us. Um, it, that, it's that recent. Yeah, you know, and if yeah, we'd yeah. fought a war in the 1990s where it was a f- right. uh, where t- hundreds of thousands of Americans had, had killed each other, uh, it would be absolutely d- very difficult to come back together. But they did. But they did. Yes. And before that, uh, there'd been really strict rules. I mean. The Union was tough. Uh, Reconstruction had generally failed. There had been ca- uh, terrorist campaigns in the no. South against it. Um, in, in Confederate graves in northern military cemeteries were not allowed to be upkept or tended yeah. to, not even by their families. They couldn't come there and, and, and cut the grass. But after this war, they decided, you know what, we're going to take the Confederate dead who are scattered around Washington, D.C. area, and we're going to give them a plot in the back left corner of Arlington Cemetery. Arlington Cemetery, which was on the the, the property that had been owned by Robert E. Lee before the war. Yes, the first federal cemetery, um, which which was a union act of defiance to start burying their dead there. And a few years later, the Daughters of the Confederacy came and petitioned Congress, can we build a monument here? Now, the memorial to the dead was carved by a uh, Jewish Confederate veteran who uh, was living in uh, living in Catholic Rome. He'd left the country. Uh, a complicated and interesting man. A sure. young guy who'd fought in the war, who who became an archi- uh, a sculptor, who was lauded by kings and queens, who ended up hosting Ulysses S. Grant wow. at his own art studio. Um, he came back and he carved a beautiful memorial to the dead. 
Um, it it laments the dead. It laments the lost cause. Uh, not the, it, it's got so it does have some of that lost cause imagery. Sure. In okay. It. If you look at the frieze around the outside, for example, there's a, a a black kind of mammy figure handing a child to be kissed by the soldier father who's on okay. his way to war, and there's a slave who's accompanying his master to war, uh, and that's what some of the 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 anger that people have sure. against this statue, this memorial. Um, but it also has the laurel symbolizing honor with the, with the robed woman at the top holding on to the plowshare. Yeah. This is the end of the war. Uh, it, it's not a the South Pole Rise Again sure. memorial. It's a people died, people fought, right. let's come back together. And this was a, it was put up at a time that was imperfect. But, yes. uh, the Daughters of the American Confederacy, not a single one of them could vote. There had right. been no universal suffrage. It would still be another uh, couple of decades before black military veterans were allowed to be buried in Arlington. Yeah. Um, it was still a tough time, but this was one that brought Union soldiers and Confederate soldiers together. Right. The sculpture was eventually buried under that, and it's just a beautiful monument to coming back to, to reconciliation between the North and the South. That's something that should not be torn down, but the Pentagon is trying to move ahead right now to wow. take it down. It could. There's, there were rumors swirling over the weekend that it could be as soon as this week. Um, fortunately, nothing's happened yet, yeah. but that's that's that kind of right and wrong, there is no gray, there is no in-between – that view of history has been really corrosive to our sure. to our culture and to our our, our, our the way our that we society. deal with each other. Yes, our society, of course. It, you know, it, remember, I mean, Abraham Lincoln had the right idea, which was with malice toward none and charity towards all. Right, the concept of grace: show people grace, show your enemies grace. You have to. That's the only way you can reach some kind of reconciliation. And when we turn our back on this, and in fact, this sort of opens it up to the the other questions, which is. As we tear at our common heritage, we have a common heritage, right? The Civil War is part of our common heritage. Um, but, but certainly going back to the founding of the United States, if we cannot agree on who we are as a people and the principles on which our nation was founded and that those are good principles, how can we ever come together to solve the thorny problems that we that we are facing as a society. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican, conservative or, or in progressive. This moment, we couldn't. That, right. That this is, but this is what I'm saying is this is part of what common sense is getting at is – the idea of saying we have a common heritage, that common heritage is an inherent good. Yes, we've made mistakes, but we have to understand that heritage in order to proceed and solve problems, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. what what are our people, what binds the people together except for common heroes, common legends and folklores? Sometimes those legends are right. about the founding, and, and there's an active movement in academia and amongst the experts to tear the true parts out, to tear the... Uh, to tear, tear also down the legends sure. of our founding. We usually have a shared language, shared borders, often a shared religion, but not right. always. Um, and all of these things are being torn at. We're at a point right now in American society where even the start, even the national anthem is being torn. Yeah, at. patriotic absolutely. displays at, at at sports games. Sports have been politicized kids wearing, themselves. Kids wearing patriotic clothes to school, right? A kid can't wear something celebrating the United States. Uh, without without getting castigated at school, how can we possibly come together as a people there? Yeah, we just took uh, – I got my first grade stepson. We just took him out of an elite Capitol Hill public school around the corner, or at least yeah. one that people really liked, because they were indoctrinating him. They weren't teaching him about what made people yeah. the same. They were teaching him about what made him different. Right. They told the kindergartners, hey, wear a sweatshirt. It's a special day. Everyone wears a sweatshirt. These kindergartners came in, and they told him about Trayvon Martin. Oh my <laughs> like God. this kid's in oh kindergarten. My, wow. This is also Trayvon Martin is not Emmett Till. This yes. is not a serious moment in American history. Yes. It's it's important in your weird lives. Um, it's their te- the people are really heightening and hyping, uh, hyping what what makes us different and not right. what brings us together. And the the proof is in the pudding here. You look at any kind of polls. Do people think that race relations in America have gotten better? Do people trust their neighbors more? Uh, no, all of those things are going in the wrong right. direction. And that's problematic. Uh, civic society is important. Mutual trust is important. Right. Love for your brothers and your neighbors is important. And those are some of the things we want to talk about. You know, it, it gets into, you know, the principles upon which the United States were founded were common sense principles. It, actually, let me, let me get into this because you, you, you reference experts and the rule by experts. And one of the people that I, I just drives me to distraction is this guy, Tom Nichols, who I don't know if you're familiar. <laughs> yeah, radio, radio. I am I am vaguely familiar with him because he used to be at the Federalist. Right, okay. Uh, and he's gotten a little batty. But but the point <laughs> is, is that he wrote this book about the death of experts. He's like, well, listen, I think that dex, that experts should inform policy, but, the, but at some point in time, and, I, and I'm reminded of an example, again, where expertise and common sense conflict, um, dealing with regulations as I do. Years ago, 
uh, the EPA wanted to, they instituted something called, or wanted to institute something called the, the off-road diesel engine rule, essentially getting at tractors. And they created this whole Rube Goldberg system to deal with the emissions of diesel from tractors. And it came down to, ma they were going to mandate that every, uh, every tractor has this box put on its engine. And they were moving forward with this rule until one farmer turned around and said, hey, I don't know what you all are talking about here. If I put a box on my engine in my tractor, I'm not going to be able to shut the hood of my tractor. What am I supposed to do then? And the whole thing fell apart because <laughs> the expertise conflicted with the common sense of, of looking at it. I mean, again, talking about Lincoln, this is the kind of thing that would have driven Abraham Lincoln to distraction, I would think. Your, yeah. your thoughts here. Well, we need we need less experts. We need more statesmen. And right. that's what this country has really suffered from, and uh, especially during COVID, for yeah. example. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, during COVID, because the politicians decided that they weren't able to make common sense ideas anymore, they weren't able to tell fact from fiction anymore, they ceded control entirely to Dr. Fauci and the medical establishment, who may be experts in disease, but they're not experts on people. You need people who take into account the state, the whole people, right. the polis. Okay, what is the impact this is going to have on families, on loved ones? What's right. the impact it's going to have on children's education? What's the impact it's going to have on crime? What's the impact it's going to have on, on, on worship? What the, what's the impact it's going, is it going to have on mental health? Right. And if you have one expert who says, like, wow, well, you, know, you might get sick, I'm in charge now. <laughs> I mean, uh, th that's something that doesn't take, take into account the whole and – this country, in the, the West in general, definitely needs more statesmen, more people Listen, who take it in town. I just remember getting into a bait when, of course, we're all, if you're still on Facebook or your social media, stuff pops up in your memories. And, of course, it was when we're recording this, it was right about three years ago right now that, that the lockdown started to happen. Yeah. And I remember a couple of it months in. St. Patrick's it, Day weekend. Yeah, I remember it. it, it so, so I remember a couple of months in, beautiful spring day, driving by the playground in my neighborhood and the athletic fields in my neighborhood. And the athletic field in my neighborhood was cordoned off with yellow police tape. And there was a sign out there saying you could not go out and play on the field. And this irked me to no end. Because listen, again, I don't claim to be an epidemiologist, but I have a certain degree of understanding about uh, epidemiology and virology. Common sense. Again, common sense, <laughs> right? And common sense dictates that if you have a bunch of kids out there playing on an athletic field, kicking a soccer ball around, A, we know that kids are not nearly as at risk for COVID one as One of the first things are. we learned. One of the first things we learned. But the idea that somehow you're going to transmit COVID playing soccer with other people. And I posted this on Facebook and and – the, the explosion of anger from folks on the other side about how dare you question this. You don't know if someone spits on a ball. You might the get ball. them sick. You're you, killing you, kids. Yes, you're, and it was, it was just this thing, no. <laughs> and we want kids to be outside. Now, it was one of those things where I thought once summer hit that America was going to have had enough of, of the lockdowns, summer of 2020, and parents were going to be tired of this. No, it turns out we – we had another year in us of it became of it became a religious virtue signal, there, right? I mean, I just uh, traveled all through Europe and I saw almost yeah. zero masks anywhere. And yes. that, Europe is to the left of the United States of by far, but because it's so politicized here in the United States by the left, I, as soon as I get back to Dulles Airport in Virginia, oh my masks God. everywhere. Yes, I see people walk driving by themselves in masks. Well, and because that that's a symbol that says I'm better than you. But I'm it, smarter. I follow the it, experts. Is it is it masks at Dulles? Because I've been, or is it masks? Because I know you do a fair amount of travel. I mean, I I don't think I've seen as many masks in other airports. But I think you know certain hubs, but certainly DC area, area airports. There are a lot yes. of there are a lot of masks. I don't see a lot. Of, I don't see a lot of masks down in. Down in Richmond, which is a very political area. Yeah, let me let me let's shift gears a little bit to sort of peel this back. And it, 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 folks are tired of hearing me say this. I was at one point going to do a podcast called Outside Interests because I think it's important for folks to and interview policy folks and political folks about things having nothing to do with politics and policy. And thankfully, we've been talking about cultural issues here. But I think it's important for folks to understand that. People aren't monolithic, that they have these kinds of outside interests. We made reference to this earlier. You're an avid cook. Um, Love it. Yeah. So are you going to are you going to be doing the the, the cooking uh, portion of, of a Common Sense magazine? Yes, absolutely. Uh, OK. I'm, I'm insanely, I'm insanely <laughs> I've already jealous. got a couple of things lined up uh, for the, our first issue is right now slated. Of course, these things are always up in the air, but slated to come out in January of 2024. OK. Um, so I have to come up with more of a winter theme. Sure. But I'm looking forward already to finding a reason to do a New England style clam bake. Nice. With a photographer for work. Of course. Hey. <laughs> teach people wow. how to do it when you dig the pit in the 
the beach or in their backyard and you fill it with boulders and wood and you make yeah. a massive bonfire and cook the cook the lobsters and the steamers and everything on top of the seaweed. Yeah. It is so much fun to do. Sure. And it's one of the best meals you have, but it is a pain in the butt finding yes. someone who's going to let you dig a hole in their yard. Yeah, absolutely. Well, <laughs> and I'm sure you'll find somebody for this. But other other sort of cooking, what, what are the other kind of outside interests that you have? I mean, I know you've got a, a stepson who's a first grader. That obviously takes up a lot of time. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> it, sure, it certainly does. Yeah. Um, a lot of time driving back and forth to school, and, and, and it's a great time. Last night we, were, we had a... My fiance is on the road, yeah. so we had boys' night. So I had a couple yeah. of friends over. Nice. We had laser tag outside. Excellent. That's probably not going to make it into the magazine, but it was a blast. Uh, I want to include no pun intended. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I want to include uh, some aspects on hunting. Yeah, uh, and different different parts of that culture. I want to, since we're an international magazine, I want to be able to pull in both the readers' interests that we have in Europe, yeah. as well as the readers' interests in the different regions of the United States, which are so varied: the Northeast, the Southeast. And then the, the the center of the country, Texas, yeah. Southwest, uh, try to pull on all those different uh, aspects. Include some things on on travel, um, and fortunately, there are great musicians, there are great artists, there are great things to do in all these different regions of the world. So exploring those and uh, being very photo heavy and bringing that to people is going to be a uh, it's going to be a lot yeah. of fun. So in in sort of also in the interest of disclosure. I've known Chris Bedford for a number of years now. Chris actually went to college with my brother, which is something we discovered at a dinner years later uh, yes. at, when, when you asked me if I was related to my brother Christopher, uh, which, I, which I am. How did you get started down this road? Were you always a conservative? Were you always interested in these weighty issues of, of culture and, and society? I was, but I was not always a conservative Okay, remotely. I wanted to do politics, and I didn't want to be a politician. Um, I was a leftist, I would okay. say, when right, I was yeah. in high school and sure. earlier. Um, and, you know, uh, some of those ideas that I had that I think were not quite well formed, I've sort of come back to it in a number yeah. of ways as more of a kind – of, as I found my way as more of a populist kind of thinking conservative. I thought that I was a – I was reactionary to things yeah. around me. And I thought I was a liberal because I didn't think the Iraq war was great. I wasn't sure. a huge fan of George W. Bush. Uh, when I got to college, uh, one the first thing that really started to change me was 9-11. Yeah. Actually going to Ground Zero the day they took down the last wall uh, that December and walking around and seeing the photographs out through the north end of yeah. uh, Little Italy of people, have you seen this person, have you seen sure. this person, was, uh, was a real awakening from this kind of dumb – uh, left wing idea that that there's no evil out there. It's just reaction. David reaction. Mamet called it being mugged by mid east reality. Yeah, yeah, it was an absolute mugging by reality. Uh, Johnny Cash is music yeah. played uh, a big role sure. in, in kind of uh, pushing me in the right direction. But the final straw was really going to college and seeing what the unguarded views of my left wing professors sure. were. Sure, and it's gotten so much worse oh, yeah. since I was there. But I originally thought that all right, there's you're left wing, but you're patriotic. You love your family. You love your God. Uh, and it turns out, no, they don't. <laughs> they really don't. They're, yeah. they're, they were antagonistic and hostile and mocked the idea wow. of the family, mocked religion, uh, were openly antagonistic toward the country. I had students and, and, taking the side of the Taliban, which, you know, I was a dove, it but under not. And <laughs> under the patina of, of saying, no, we're just challenging your orthodoxies. We're just trying to get you to. Yeah, indoctrination. Which, of course, which of course you know, we, we now flip it around, and we have to have these opportunities where we have conversations with students and young people where we let them know, Maybe you can think about things in a different way than the than the uh, than the uh, propagandizing, the indoctrination you're getting from your professors. Yeah, now you know that was one good thing about COVID. Yeah, is that it gave people a sudden suddenly people were at home with their kids if they had that opportunity if they're yeah. white collar workers and their kids were talking to their teachers and they're sitting there working at the kitchen table and they're hearing the stuff their teachers are saying. Yeah, and like. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, yes. I mean, we, we just assumed Americans, I think, had probably correctly, rightly, at least right-minded in their assumption that the kids were getting the same education that they got. Sure, of course. That they could trust these institutions not to corrupt their children. That they could drop their kid off at school and he'll learn how to read and write and, and right. do mathematics. And it turns out that it's not what they were getting. Right. They were getting indoctrinated. So the American people, uh, left wing, right wing, center, centrist, are completely apolitical. Suddenly realize school's not doing exactly what we have wanted it to, and we have to get engaged. We sure. have to be a part of it. We have to tour the school. We have to look at the books. You have to keep up with the teachers, and that's been a a, a, a positive from COVID. And I I would be remiss if I didn't point out that one of the things a common sense society is doing is it is trying to empower educators who 
don't share that orthodoxy by providing them with with the materials that they need to talk about these issues about Western civilization. Am I, I'm, I'm right. You're here, totally right. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's educators from all different kinds of backgrounds. Just like I, I was able to do the uh, Britannia Fellowship this past yep. year, which is intense and wonderful out in Wiltshire. Uh, Western England. We got to go to Roger Scruton's home. Right. His uh, Lady Scruton get to- toured us around. We saw a concert there. But the student, the, the people who were there, was not like your average conservative yeah. conference. It was liberals. It was conservatives. It was libertarians. It was people who were just more interested, maybe in foreign policy. All, but all people who were curious. Yes. And the speakers were similar to that as well. But they they put all of them came back around to make to push you to think about what is liberty, what is prosperity, what is beauty. Where do these things come from, and how do we how do we foster them? But let me ask you this before I let you go, because I, 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 I you know we keep coming back to questions, because we're talking about Europe, and obviously Europe and European nations. There's the conflict between the concept of the European Community and the EU and the open borders, but there are still distinct national identities, right? And it's one of the things I used to talk about the difference. One of the the difference between France and America is. I could move to France and live there for 50 years and I would never be considered French, I would be considered an American, but anybody can move to America and become an American. But these issues of national identity are really under assault. Uh, the, and, and, and nations that wanna protect their identity, if you have mass migration from people whose values and belief systems don't reflect your own from other nations coming through and becoming refugees and then trying to change the culture, there is nothing wrong with trying to defend something that is inherently Hungarian or inherently Icelandic or inherently French, right? I mean, I might, no, there's yeah, nothing wrong yeah. with that, and it's, it's under attack again by those experts in yes. Brussels. Uh, Brussels is a perfect encapsulation of the European problem. That's the city I got to go to in 2006 when I was studying abroad, and then got to go back to uh, this past week. Yeah. The decline is marked. Yeah. It's disgusting. There's garbage everywhere. There's complete ghettos for the Islamic uh, immigrants who've come there. And it's been a, it's been a source of the radicalization, the terror attacks right. we saw in Germany and France. They're all kind of tracked back to these ghettos in Brussels uh, and these radical mosques. There's a, Europe has, for a long time, basically had a permanent underclass. Sure. But it's continuing. They right. think that they're more enlightened now, but there's this kind of permanent outsider underclass in Europe that's... Uh, that's very ugly and very yes. sad to see. And you know, what, the good thing is, when you, I got to do a lot of traveling during COVID to report on the state of the country. Yeah. When you drive outside of the cities and outside of the coasts of the United States, it's really reinvigorating. Yes. I mean, I, we were hanging out with literal cowboys. We yep. were hanging out with ranchers, hanging out with people who worked on the rails. And the beating heart of America is still strong, even Absolutely. if the brain is kind of rotted. <laughs> Europe, you don't always get that sense. Um, yeah. The... I, I am much more uh, bullish on the American reinvention good, than I am in the European. It, it's, it's, you know, one of the great benefits. I don't know if Chris, you would ever, my brother Christopher and you would ever talked about this, but, you know, we would drive across country. That's how we would spend our summer vacations. We would drive, uh, we would drive. Being in a car with Chris Langer. Yes, that imagine, imagine that. Yes, yes, yes. It's got quite, a lot of energy. Quite, quite a bit, <laughs> especially, you know, given our age difference. Um, but but the idea of of going and driving across country and seeing the real America, you know, and talking to people in, you know, St. Joseph's, Missouri or Albuquerque, New Mexico or, or wherever, it, it's so vital to sort of see how the, how everybody else lives. Growing up in suburban New York, as I did, before I let you go, um, you talk about young young people, young scholars. What's what's the age cutoff for participating in the Common Sense Society? I'm not young anymore. There's no. But uh, I would I would love to go. I can say there's no age cutoff. Okay. But I'm in my mid 30s, and I was certainly a little bit older. All right, than there you some go. Some of the folks uh, there. And <laughs> well, there you go. So I. I but so maybe I'm, come as a teacher. I would love to come as a teacher. Chris Bedford, uh, thank you. So, oh, how do folks find out more about the Common Sense Society? They go to commonsensesociety.org. Uh, the magazine will be coming out in January, and we have a Substack. And uh, that's great. I look forward to to the magazine, and and uh, it's just congratulations on all of this. Thanks very much. Thank you. This has been another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. As you said, you can find us on uh, all podcast platforms. If you're listening to us, you can find us on YouTube. I'm Andrew Langer, your host. Enjoy the rest of your lunch. This has been the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast, hosted by Andrew Langer. Check out the Federal Newswire's family of websites, as well as their social media stream. 